person. So I will go in a very much human side of the whole story. Yeah. So, and maybe a little bit provocative, but I hope this will be for the good. Great. This is why you are here, Violeta. <laughs> no, <laughs> <we're not> here. <laughs> I See, Karen, so. eventually we did it together. Yeah. You know, we were I planning, was... but here you go. Yeah. You know? yeah. Good morning, Francesco. Oh, hello, good morning. I just joined in. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good, good, morning. Good, good to having you. We are all online now. Uh, here's uh, Violeta, Karin. Uh, I think you have met both. You will remember Karin from uh, the autumn of, uh, from the uh, conference. You. I do you, remember uh, indeed. Yes. Uh, I do too, Francesco. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to get my cats out. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> or we lost them out. And there is uh, Slaven. You also remember Slaven Michkovic, right? Oh, um, sure, yes. Yeah, hello. And, uh, hello. There is uh, Sebastian who is uh, going to be the operative host, and uh, today uh, um, um, my other uh, colleague from the CBA team. Uh, this is uh, the this, this is the, uh, the the team that is online right now. Uh, we have tried your slides, um, so everything works uh, very well. Um, we will have a short introduction. Um, uh, and I will uh, introduce all of you uh, to the participants um, who are going to uh, start coming in right now. And uh, then uh, you will be the first speaker, Francesco. Uh, after that, uh, will I? Uh, okay. After the uh, no, sorry, uh, the Violeta goes first, and then there is you. Violeta uh, makes mm -hmm. introduction. Then there is you. Each of you, uh, it's recommended to have twelve to fifteen uh, minutes. You will do a big favor uh, to me if you, you know, if you're roughly on time. I, uh, okay. I don't have the habit to in to interrupt you because I think it's much more precious that you, you know, that you keep your thread. Uh, but uh, it's also important not to not to derail from from the timing. Um, so um, after you, there will be. Um, question time so I, I expect there will be some questions if there is no question then I, I will ask a question each of you as speakers can 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 of course contribute uh, with questions uh, then uh, after that um, there is uh, who's first I think me Slaven, right yeah Slaven then, and then Karin concludes uh, and uh, the, there's question time again uh, so um, after that um, we will have some some uh, in instructions for the second part of the seminar, which starts only at 15:30. Uh, the whole uh, uh, timing is uh, supposed to be limited to 90 minutes uh, right now. Okay. Uh, do you All think right. We are, uh, yeah, please. Yeah, uh, just quickly a question: uh, Am I the first one and the only one uh, not on Zoom? Yes, unfortunately, yes. Okay, okay, no problem. Uh, and also, how many people uh, signed up for this event? I mean, aside from us, speakers and so on. Uh, there, are, roughly. Uh, there are roughly, there are close to 50 participants registered. Uh, mm -hmm. There are, uh, it's, a, it's a quite a mixed group, uh, inter very inter international, I would say. Uh, also, uh, in a good part, thanks to, to all of you uh, who, who worked on, on LinkedIn <laughs> extensively. And so we've got uh, some, uh, I mean, French people, Austrians. Uh, Greece just uh, Greece, logged in. Yes, <laughs> Greece, uh, some Slovenians. Uh, I think there, is, there are some people from India. There's, uh, I think, somebody with the, uh, from the World Bank. So uh, there are people from uh, the local in Teza, São Paulo. So it's, it's quite, uh, quite a this variety. Time. Uh, and I'm, I'm very pleased with uh, with this uh, turnout. There are some researchers from institutes, uh, uh, people from uh, in, um, innovation promotion promotion agencies, for example, um, somebody from Torino. Um, uh, uh, I remember who I, who I from before. So I think quite quite a, a very quite a good a very high quality group of, of people who are engaged with with uh, circularity, with uh, with uh, business model transformation. And I think it can it can really be a good audience. Excellent, thanks, Yuri. Yeah. Okay, uh, Sebastian, how are we doing uh, with with? Uh, uh, you should let us know when when people are. are we ready. already have twenty one um, oh. people joined, but they all they're all named Massimo <laughs> because we didn't have the automated uh, system. 
uh, set up yet. So I would like to. Uh, but I think they can do it themselves. If, yeah, if they can press on their own name on yeah. their own icon and choose more and rename. Yeah. So I'm sorry for the inconvenience. That's totally okay. If you can. <laughs> Very funny to have everyone named Massimo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The cloning is real. Yep. It works. So uh, do we hear each other? Is everybody, uh, can everybody hear? Yes, actually, uh, yes, you are a little clear. low. You, you, your voice, Yuri, is a little bit low. I can hear everyone else better than you. Mm -hmm. Is this better much now? Much better, much better. Okay, it's because, yeah, it, it's a little uh, low. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we can, uh, uh, um, Sebastian, is, uh, uh, do all of us, all participants, hear each other now? I can hear you well. Yeah, so, I mean, also others. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay, so I think we, we can, we can yeah, slowly we can start uh, while other people are... Yeah, and people uh, should, be demu should be demuted, right? They should uh, be muted when they when they listen and only demute when they talk, right? Will you exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So if you allow me, I will I will take over the screen. Good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. We will start in, in a minute. We would just like to uh, have really everybody on board. And we are pleased with a very high uh, turnout. So this means inevitably that we should wait a minute more so that everybody can join in. I think I think we can we can start if you agree. Um, good morning again. Um, my name is Yuri Giacomelli. I'm going to be the moderator of uh, this uh, webinar today, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all at uh, the uh, financing of uh, the uh, circular uh, business through the pandemic, uh, our CBA uh, webinar, which is going to be held in two uh, parts. Uh, today and um, in the next minutes I will introduce um, how um, the, the program uh, will uh, run. Uh, our um, seminar today is organized by uh, the Circular uh, Business Academy in uh, cooperation with the Public uh, Fund for Human Resources Development of the uh, Republic of uh, Slovenia, uh, whom we generously uh, thank and uh, uh, share uh, their welcome uh, uh, address. Uh, uh, of course, this is uh, this the seminar is uh, free of uh, charge and is uh, co-financed by the European um, Social uh, Fund and uh, the Slovenian uh, Ministry of Labour, Family, uh, uh, Social Affairs, and Equal uh, Opportunities. Um, we uh, thank you in advance for sharing feedback at the end of this seminar because this will help us um, improve our work and um, uh, provide even better uh, quality in the future. Um, the, let me uh, spend just a couple of words on uh, the Circular Business uh, Academy. 
uh, it, it is a dedicated knowledge platform enabling managers and entrepreneurs, experts, investors, policymakers um, uh, to embrace circular business model innovation by uh, creating and exchanging and sharing, sp uh, sharing specific competence and try on the civilization, uh, civil civilizational paradigm shift. We consider uh, the eco-civilization as the final destination of this complex um, uh, engaging process of which we are all uh, uh, a, a part. And we believe that uh, today's turnout, which is close to uh, 50 engaged participants, is a good demonstration of uh, how high on a priority list uh, this is for many, many uh, of us. Uh, why the Circular Business uh, Academy? Above all, we focus on business models. We focus on business models transformations. We try to, uh, to help business people do good business by uh, thriving on this uh, complex uh, tr transformation. We approach them in, in many ways, uh, particularly uh, to three uh, types of formats. One is, of course, a knowledge sharing platform. Such a, a webinar is one way of uh, doing it. Uh, we do it with a high number of uh, partnerships um, and uh, supporters. Uh, the second um, approach is uh, the incubation of sustainable innovation ecosystems at uh, various levels, of course, from a company level to uh, regional city levels and uh, with uh, the, the intro knowledge sharing uh, at, at the systemic level. The third um, aspect is uh, financing uh, facilitation. Actually, this seminar uh, falls within the first uh, format, but actually addresses uh, issues related, related to financial um, facilitation um, quite significantly. Uh, today, we are going to um, address um, uh, some, I think, quite important questions uh, that are um, uh, uh, that that uh, uh, in the time of uh, a pandemic um, are addressed to uh, many of us. Is uh, uh, the pandemic and the global economic uh, downturn uh, affecting um, circular? Um, uh, front runners in a positive way? Is uh, is this a negative impact? Are we prepared? Uh, what will be the consequences? And uh, more particularly, what are uh, what is the role of banks um, uh, in, in in this uh, period? How do private investors uh, uh, tackle such issues? And how actually we, uh, as uh, generally as, as in our respective roles, can approach um, the challenges that uh, we are faced with? Uh, how more specifically, how can sustainable firms uh, who are developing circular business models pursue their course in uh, this uh, uncertainty? Um, um, so um, we we have some excellent speakers, and I'm uh, going to present uh, uh, you all of them in in a minute. Uh, let me say that the, uh, we are uh, working in two parts today. The, uh, there is about a 90 minute. Um, um, first part of the seminar uh, with um, uh, very interesting introductory uh, speeches uh, and um, instructions for the homework that you will be able to do um, in, in between the first and the second part uh, during the uh, lunch break. At 15.30, we are coming back. Um, the homework will be to uh, get to know the, the, um, uh, the circularity assessment tool, which we, we call CAS. Some of you have actually uh, already uh, compiled a questionnaire that is freely accessible on, on our website, and I will uh, deliver further instructions to that in a minute. Uh, here are the speakers uh, of the uh, today's seminar. Um, I'm very pleased to um, introduce uh, Mrs. Violeta Bulls, uh, who, who we know as entrepreneur, manager, advisor, lecturer, author, uh, and uh, the, uh, the wider international public uh, knows uh, Violeta as uh, the European Commissioner for Transport um, in uh, the last uh, term of the European uh, Commission. Um, the, our second speaker today is uh, Francesco Ferrero, the head of um, European Investment Bank Group office in Ljubljana, Slovenia. Uh, uh, third, uh, Slaven uh, Michkovic, uh, experience uh, the risk manager and researcher 
uh, in uh, Abanka, uh, and Karin Huberheim, the, uh, uh, the academic program director um, at uh, the University of Applied Sciences uh, uh, in uh, Vienna, specialized in sustainability and uh, responsibility uh, management. Luigi Amati, um, the president of uh, Business Angels Europe, and Peter Grosnik um, are going to uh, join us in the second half of uh, the seminar. Uh, just quickly, let me go through the house rules. Um, uh, please, the, the most important rule is, of course, please be active, please participate. You can do this by using the chat box all the time. Uh, we will try to answer all your questions. Uh, you can help each other by answering them, uh, not just by addressing them. Uh, uh, secondly, there will be time available for, for discussion, for your questions, and we will try to uh, answer them um, right, right, right away. Um, also, of course, when you don't speak, it's advisable to mute your uh, uh, microphone uh, so that uh, no disturbing voices would come in between. Um, uh, then, of course, you will be invited to compile the, the QCAS questionnaire. Here is the link where you can find it. And uh, again, you will uh, get these further instructions later on. Uh, don't forget to provide us feedback after that and stay, stay uh, tuned. Um, this webinar is uh, recorded. All the materials uh, will be available from, from the website. So all the presentations will be delivered uh, to you um, just after the seminar uh, uh, freely from, from the website of the Circular Business Academy. Uh, and here, of course, um, is our first speaker, uh, the, the introductory speaker uh, this morning. Um, Violeta Bulls, uh, who is addressing uh, questions related to resilience and sustainable demand development in times of the pandemic. Um, may I hand you over the word, uh, Vileta, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Yuri. And uh, good morning to everyone who is uh, all over the world on the other side of this frequency. Uh, it's always uh, really, uh, for me, uh, I'm very curious who are the faces? What is the energy on the other side that joined uh, uh, the session? But um, considering the topic, I know that you are those who will make a change. So uh, I hope you will be provocative enough with your questions uh, that we can uh, calibrate our joint actions and from this seminar on uh, be even more coordinated in our attempts to follow uh, the inner call for um, sustainable planet for sustainable life and uh, as Yuri mentioned as a long-term vision um, a new eco-civilization. I know sometimes this word civilization is too big but you know in the last 40,000 years many of them happened and many new civilizations emerged and there is no reason why we wouldn't be at the beginning of the new one today. Uh, and I feel that that is uh, in the air. So. Um, Let's hope we'll have a bit more insights at the end of uh, this day um, into why do we believe that that is something emerging in the horizon. But uh, before I go straight into my presentation, I would like to uh, raise uh, one statement and ask you to pause for a second and go deep into your heart and uh, think about it. Um, I believe that the change that we are discussing today has nothing to do with money. It has to do with our awareness and simply our decision that we're going to do things differently from this point on. And you don't need money for that. After that, money will follow the project that will emerge out of this frequency. So now I'm inviting you to pause for a second and think about it. What do you feel inside, in your chest? Are you with me? Well, you can chat, uh, you can uh, share your comments in the uh, chat room, but I will continue with the content um, infused by uh, the energy that we just created. I can feel it. I'm very excited here inside. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, also switch to a few of the pictures that I prepared for you. 
and uh, go really straight into the discussion. Uh, what's happening now? Uh, has the pandemic changed the conditions under which we can engage? And uh, what could that potentially be? So first of all, I'd like to say that uh, we have the same amount of money as we had a couple of weeks ago in circulation. I would be even more provocative and say maybe we even have it more than before. Uh, but let's leave the discussion for another day. So uh, the question is now, can we develop predictability and trust with our projects and our behavior that those that make decisions where the money goes will trust sustainable development models and strategies and of course uh, redirect the money in the projects that support that philosophy. How do you feel about that? These are fundamental questions, at least for me, and I'm inviting you to, to, to consider them. So uh, how do you behave when introducing sustainable projects? How do you uh, behave and how do you present them with the confidence or with the fear, or with the um, people behind you, customers, and uh, clear customers' needs that we are addressing? Or uh, are we still a bit shy, not really sure? that that's the way we should proceed. Uh, I'm fully on the side of eco-civilization, sustainable development and circular economy. That doesn't mean it's easy. Uh, it's not easy. And many times, personally, I'm challenged uh, if, uh, whenever I need to make personal decisions uh, to walk this path. But I know that with every step where there are more and more people around me, um, my uh, decisions and my personal choices are more confident and more sustainable uh, and the change is happening. But of course, it's good to know that the same kind of uh, steps are being made on a system level. And uh, it's, uh, I'm sure that my colleague from uh, EIB will go more into details, but uh, I would like to uh, share with you this slide that shows how much EU is already committing um, as on the investment side to the sustainable European investment plan and also uh, that this did not happen overnight but it's been a long uh, period that EU has been paving the way to get here so I can confidently say that under the previous commission uh, we all had to readjust our portfolios to the sustainable um, development strategies and of course engage with the financial institutions uh, to reshape the way how we prioritize projects and give priorities to those that have sustainable value. That's why of course part of the FC investment uh, program was also the focus on, on which is also called Juncker's plan, was also focused on uh, sustainability. Only in transport, 60% of all investments uh, were made uh, towards the sustainable development already in the previous uh, five years. And if I share with you that we invested 270 billion euros in five years time, I mean, this is quite a substantial amount of money that has been already uh, steered in this direction. So that brings more confidence, that uh, brings more clarity and more predictability. Uh, so um, yes, my answer is yes. Uh, we will see more investments in, uh, uh, in this sector. Um, and it's up to us to make sure that our projects that we present are mature uh, and they have a very clear business plan uh, that, uh, as I said, uh, ensures the predictability uh, and uh, stability in a sense of uh, investment recovery. So banks do play a role, but not the only ones. Uh, I mean, uh, I pay a lot of attention and I used to pay a lot of attention while in my previous job, um, also to the institutional investors being um, insurance funds or pension funds or just uh, investment banks, uh, not only EU, 
Investment Bank, where I have to say that the European Investment Bank has been it's really responsive. And uh, just a few weeks before the pandemic, they even declared um, to be the first green bank in the world, um, dedicating uh, very strongly uh, their future strategic development to this subject, uh, transforming over the next 10, 20 years into a completely green bank. That is, was a very strong message, and uh, I haven't heard them um, denying it yet. There might be um, a year or two of uh, a slowdown, but uh, just because the whole economy might slow down, even though here the investors will play the major role because uh, investors are the ones who push the economy for, for, uh, further. And um, investments in, for example, green infrastructure that has a low but uh, stable uh, gains over the next 20, 30 years is certainly uh, the, the green economy where um, financial institutions can uh, play an extremely important role, especially pension funds and, uh, as that I mentioned before, and the insurance funds, uh, the green infrastructure for them is really uh, attractive, being in transport, digital, or uh, energy. Private investors will play an important role too, especially in the startup business. And uh, we, I'm presenting you here a couple of uh, show which the areas where these startups can find um, its place and European Commission, European Parliament are jointly uh, yearly pushing for green startup um, community to, uh, to be in touch, I mean to be active, to promote itself uh, and uh, it's uh, every year we see broader uh, scope of uh, startup companies and SMEs who come on board presenting, uh, presenting their bright new ideas and uh, I will never forget the message that they gave us uh, at one of the sessions that I, uh, I moderated with them. They said, please uh, don't think that we uh, only need money. Primarily we need data. So this is something uh, to consider uh, because it's true for new business models to emerge, you need to have access to big data uh, in order to be innovative and look for uh, completely new horizontal uh, solutions, businesses, services, uh, we are, where, of course, all of us will have to play an uh, important role and stay open, make sure the data stay uh, open and that uh, startups and SMEs have access to it. Uh, so without going into real details um, in, in these models, uh, but you could see that, for example, only in the sustainable mobility, you have at least five major areas where um, sustainable development can play, uh, uh, models can play extremely important role, being green vehicles, renewable uh, fuels and energies, uh, green infrastructure uh, for sustainable um, mobility solutions, smart mobility. Um, here we see that digital and transport and energy jointly play uh, a probably a front runner's role. And I'm glad that the European Commission decided uh, already under the previous mandate and that state in the plan that they will specially stimulate the projects where all three portfolios join forces and, um, and uh, submit uh, the multi-portfolio projects that bring all this together and make, of course, uh, a platform then for completely new business models. So I'm very much inviting you to take a closer look at that, uh, especially those that are in the financial community uh, and uh, look for projects like that uh, because they will really help to reshape uh, the society. Um, the, there's going to be a huge change also in, this, um, in the field of smart mobility where uh, the, uh, especially we connected cooperative and autonomous mobility uh, where uh, the green component is one of the key drivers and justifications for the investments uh, in this uh, area. And of course, a mass mobility as a service, uh, which was um, promoted a couple, uh, which we started to promote a couple of years ago, and it became the major stream now, uh, also revenue stream in, in the field of uh, mobility. 
but without doing any ingest to other portfolios, I just want to uh, stimulate you with the concrete examples because you can find similar things in other portfolios as well. Uh, everybody was active and uh, we are really aware that for European Union, um, green agenda and uh, green technologies, green innovation, green business models are not only the uh, necessity for survival, but they are uh, excellent business opportunities uh, to stay uh, one of the strongest global players. Uh, let's not forget that European Union is, some, I mean, the second by GDP uh, global player, uh, but I'm quite convinced that um, we are the most stable one in a sense of being clear on uh, priorities that we want to uh, we want to uh, take on board and follow in order to uh, achieve also uh, results. Of course, um, pandemia challenged everything because it disrupted um, the existing economical foundation. Well, you know, this is nothing new. Uh, and uh, if we think that this is the last uh, challenge that we are facing uh, in our lifetime, well, let's uh, become real. There's going to be many of them of similar or even larger magnitude. So for me, any kind of challenge of this kind is a opportunity to really develop the capacity within myself, within uh, the community that I work or on a global scale that no matter what comes, we are able to handle it. So this capacity to handle the crisis is something I think we need to get used to it. Um, also, I'd, I'd like to share with you a thought that uh, this is, uh, the, the climate change is nothing new to the planet Earth. If you take a look at the last 25 million years, you would see there's been enormous uh, changes happening all over the planet in a certain periods, but these periods were in millions of years. Um, what human contribution to climate change is, is that because of our behavior, we speed up, speed up the changes so fast that we cannot even handle them anymore. So that they, they, they are happening in one lifetime and nobody with the body that we have can readjust that fast. So what we are called to do is to slow down our impact and follow the natural cycles, and then be able to readjust as humans and give ourselves a chance that we can continue to coexist on this planet Earth. And uh, that's why we have to have a more systemic view over what we do. Uh, so it's sustainability, it's not just reuse, recycle, reduce, or repair but it's a fundamental shift in the mentality. That's why I'm saying we have to make the shift in our awareness first, and that doesn't cost, cost any money, that co but it requires a lot of inner strength in each individual uh, to be willing to make a change. And then we need to make sure, and I'm, I'm inviting all uh, investors especially, and project promoters, that they, by definition, as the prerequisite, at green criteria to everything that you do you know that doesn't cost any money either so as soon as you put the green components in the criteria of everything that you finance well you've done an enormous change and the rest will follow step by step so uh, here i'm really um, offering is that be along with the green awareness, we need green strategies, green criteria, green funding, and then this will be able to uh, create a foundation that we can move towards eco-civilization, which primary goal of this eco-civilization is really that the earth becomes an eco-zone of the universe. And then when we populate other planets, which now is the big buzz in the business community, Let's do it with the sustainable criteria. Unfortunately, today, they don't exist. Uh, if anybody saw the latest NASA uh, 
NASA's uh, call for proposals and the three awards that they gave for landing to the moon, uh, they drop all the garbage in, in the space, they drop the garbage on the moon, and they, there is no requirements in the call for proposals that whoever drops the parts of the rockets that they need to collect them. Nobody is called to, uh, to add to the satellites that they launch in the, in, in the orbit that there has to be a mechanism to bring them down. Yeah, so not on, today, not only that we are taking this unfair approach um, and the polluting mentality um, around the world, we're taking it to the space. So now it's time in the early stages that we say no. And who has the key investors? Because follow the money, follow the power. Uh, so please, whoever is here listening, uh, wake up in your heart, in your awareness, the part that says, I can do it. I can just put one line in the call for proposals, one line in the contract uh, that I'm making with my client that says that the project has to be green. It has to take care of uh, also uh, elements of circular economy. And we will be, instead of in the course, let's say to the right, we will be in the course to the left and in 30 years time we'll say, yes, we made the right decision. So at the end, it's 16 minutes and 24 seconds that I've used. Um, I'm just sharing the picture, which if it attracts your attention, you can find it all over the social media and many webinars that will also follow together uh, with Yuri and his team in the weeks to come, that we can explore further how can we help each other to really uh, build strong structures within which people will be uh, even more confident to take the steps towards circular economy. Thank you very much. Thank Julieta. you very much. Um, in the question time, I will ask you to share the slide representing the eco civilization. So please prepare it. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, all the all, all the entire presentation uh, of Violetas is going to be available to all of you. Uh, next week we start the debate. The actually it's going to be a, a joint exercise of um, how to imagine our final destination. We talk a lot about changing, mm -hmm. which sometimes feels like you know a trouble. We don't talk about the journey enough in, a, in terms of, uh, their, the, uh, of this destination that uh, we all desire, even though we do have this in our heads. So um, the, uh, the term eco-civilization stands for uh, the attempt of how to imagine this, because then, of course, design can happen. And uh, Violeta is a promoter of this uh, concept, so that's why I would like to shortly uh, come back to that. Um, uh, I really, um, I think you made uh, actually a very good uh, uh, disposition to uh, Francesco Ferrero, who, uh, who is coming next. On one hand, you said we are richer because we spend less during this uh, uh, unusual times. Um, I would like to, to, to hear what bankers say about that. On the other hand, of course, um, Francesco re represents the, the, the banking group, uh, uh, the Europe's market maker for uh, the climate issues and recently also for the issues related to, uh, to fight the pandemic. Uh, I'm very pleased to um, uh, having uh, him uh, here with us. Uh, and uh, I would like to, uh, to hand um, over uh, to, to him. Francesco is uh, with us on, 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 on the telephone line. Uh, he will have a, a presentation uh, which will be uh, managed by, by, by the, the host. And he will uh, address some of the issues related to how to handle the, the pandemic, what is the role of the uh, banking uh, system, and how to assure this green way out of the crisis that Violeta um, uh, talked about. Uh, so uh, please, uh, Francesco Ferrero, the, the word is yours. 
Thank you very much, Yuri. Good morning, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, unfortunately, only via phone, so even a bit more remote than most of you on Zoom. Uh, therefore, that means I won't be able to see the comments on the chat on the side, uh, but I'll be very happy to discuss and take questions after this. Uh, so, I think there was a very good segue from Yuri uh, into introducing who we are uh, as European Investment Bank. Uh, perhaps just a very uh, brief introduction about the institution. It's also on the slide at page two, uh, which should be on your screen. So, we are a policy bank. Uh, so a policy bank means that we are a public institution, so the Bank of the EU, uh, not for profit institution that really uh, whose scope is uh, uh, to pursue policy goals of the European Union, but at the same time we are also a bank. So a AAA rated institution whose model is to, to collect money on the capital markets at very, very uh, cheap rates and to turn them uh, into long-term loans. Essentially we have uh, several more products, but essentially to invest into projects which are technically sound and financially strong. Uh, so this makes us quite unique. There are other uh, similar institutions like the World Bank or EBRD, uh, but in Europe we are by far the, the, the most important also in terms of amounts uh, lenders uh, traditionally into infrastructure, let's say, uh, what EIB was doing uh, 50, 40, 30 years ago was mostly uh, bread and butter infrastructure. Then we moved on more and more into support of SMEs, uh, energy, and then today our new mission, um, which I would say it's already been the case for a number of years, is climate. Uh, climate means uh, adaptation uh, and fight to uh, climate change, uh, as well as a number of environmental goals. Um, so perhaps before moving on to this topic, I would like to, to make one thing clear. So as uh, EIB, COVID-19, of course, is the, the, the emergency of the moment. We have been fairly active on a number of fronts, not related uh, to the environment, strictly speaking, but just on fighting the, the current crisis. Because for countries, households, companies, of course, there is a matter of uh, self-preservation in the very short term uh, when there is such uh, a new type of challenge uh, that comes upon us. Uh, but of course, we are already thinking about what happens next uh, and how to continue our uh, our work. Uh, just perhaps for your information, EAB uh, at the moment uh, uh, has already committed and is delivering uh, around 40 billion of resources uh, all over Europe uh, to fight the, the, the pandemic crisis, so essentially support to uh, SMEs and the healthcare sector. Um, also out of the EU, we are quite active together with the Commission, so we have just committed over 5 billion uh, euros out of which 1.7 uh, strictly for uh, the Western Balkans, um, only for uh, for emergency related to the COVID crisis. But again, uh, aside from the, the the short term health emergency and the consequence of uh, uh, of the pandemics, uh, another thing I would like to make very clear is that the commitment uh, to anything environment, uh, climate change, and of course, in, in this uh, big basket, there is also everything that relates to the circular economy. Uh, EAB is more committed than ever. So already well before the crisis stroke, uh, we made very uh, ambitious and public uh, statements. Uh, we set targets for ourselves. So this is actually uh, at uh, slide number three. Um, so really to step up our commitment uh, to fighting climate change. And not only to do it via our uh, lending, but via our uh, financing of projects directly, but really to become a model for for the rest. So, uh, in two ways: first, uh, uh, sharing best practices and technical support and advisory, uh, but also uh, assisting the the other institutions and private sector uh, to do the same. Uh, in, what I mean here is, is really to, to use best practices to show that uh, essentially it's possible 
and it's also economically convenient uh, to, to come up with projects uh, that make a lot of sense financially and they follow the best practices from an environmental point of view. So this means that TID uh, will uh, lend 50% of our uh, annual uh, annual amounts, so which is in the region of 60 to 70 billion euros every year for environmental and uh, climate support goals. Uh, and we are uh, going to be fully aligned by the end of this year on all uh, the principles of the Paris Agreement. So this has got a lot of implications. Who's curious about what I mean? Uh, in detail, uh, of course, can go on our website. It's really a mine for information. Um, so I would uh, refer you to what we have uh, there. Uh, also, not to use up too much of my time talking about uh, EAB in general. Uh, perhaps moving on to slide number four, um, I've just put here something actually coming from, from uh, a conference uh, that uh, was arranged also by Yuri uh, in the Circular Business Academy in Slovenia just a couple of months ago, seems ages ago before uh, the lockdown uh, stroke. And, uh, I mean, I recognize some of the names of the speakers uh, were already there. We went quite in depth into um, what it means from an economic point of view, what is the economic sense of, uh, uh, of projects in the circular economy. Uh, we gave quite a lot of examples on how those should be structured, what banks and financiers uh, look in it. And we really went a little bit into the, uh, the, the, the details. Uh, today, perhaps, uh, I would like to remind, uh, also talking as, uh, as a banker with the other hat, uh, not so much of, uh, uh, let's say, a, a policy uh, person and a believer in, in all the goods uh, that uh, should come from, uh, from structuring projects and new investments properly from a circularity point of view, but also putting the hat of a banker. Uh, so essentially, we always ask ourselves the question, uh, what are the risks? If also strictly from, from a financial point of view, if we invest in a certain project, be it investing by equity, be it investing uh, in the form of uh, uh, lenders. Uh, so essentially, I believe that uh, banks and financial uh, supporters of any project typically have in mind the question, what can go wrong in this? And in a due diligence, you ask yourself a lot of systematic questions just to understand, uh, to, to make sure that you understand the project, the various implications, and indeed, what can go wrong with those. Um, so perhaps moving on to uh, slide number five here, there are a couple of things that perhaps uh, you could find interesting, which is uh, a number of typical features that we have seen after years of investing in uh, circular economy projects. Um, again, I'm, I'm not going to, to, to present specific projects as we did in the last, uh, in the last event in person uh, that really had quite a wealth of uh, case studies. Here, the topic would be more uh, about the impact of COVID-19, right? Um, so here, uh, just for, uh, let's say for everybody to be clear, uh, about what we are talking about in case maybe um, somebody is, uh, is thinking, mm, what are the, the features that, that a bank that looks both at the technical and uh, organizational uh, side of a project as well as the, the financial risks of a project, uh, what is this bank looking at? Uh, so typically here, there are a few of the features that uh, uh, we look for and have identified in circular economy projects. So uh, it's a bit wider than just recycling. Uh, so it's really about efficient and sustainable use of resources, making, uh, making uh, products in particular um, able to, to reuse, to, uh, to be repaired, remanufactured, and so extended life cycle. Uh, of such models and also in use uh, uh, different business models uh, built around it, perhaps around uh, sharing. We've seen uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, business models that, that really aim at maximizing the usage of a certain asset. <clears throat> 
finally unpredictable, of course, uh, the, the core of circular economy revolves around uh, using, using less and better the resources uh, that we have already, instead of getting more uh, that should be uh, then wasted fairly quickly. So uh, perhaps in this sense, uh, I would like to remind the role of policy, because of course here we are uh, investors, uh, activists, uh, uh, perhaps NGOs, uh, but the, the, the reality is that all of this requires uh, a number of subjects, a number of, um, of parts of our society to work in an aligned matter, and policy is, uh, is really essential. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I looked recently at the new action plan of the European Commission, which I encourage, which was published in, uh, uh, in March, so there was quite a lot of work coming to fruition in March, but of course, most of it came before the COVID crisis. And it's really, I, I was quite impressed myself by how wide ranging this is. Um, so over 2020 and 2021, there will be a, a number of regulation uh, acts, uh, directives and so on, which are going to touch quite a number of uh, different industries. So ranging from uh, manufacturing, plastics, uh, packaging, and so on. And it's really one of the, the things that uh, I would also uh, suggest everybody to keep in mind from the perspective, uh, from the perspective of a banker is that do not wait uh, for regulation to come and tell you you have to produce packaging with this and that content maximum of uh, uh, non-recyclable material or toxic material. So be proactive, because that means that when the regulation comes, you'll be ready. You don't have to improvise. You don't have to be uh, a taker of some decisions. You'll be ready uh, to hit the ground running. And uh, in this, this, this is coming, and uh, I think we'll, we're going to see an acceleration in everything which is uh, related to circular economy just in, in a matter of two or three years. Moving on to, uh, well, what is the slide number six in my presentation, uh, I would like to focus just briefly uh, your attention on the fact that financing for any, any sort of financier, be it a bank, uh, private equity, uh, or, um, you know, any sort of private investor, uh, from pension funds and insurance companies that typically have a very much detached approach. So they uh, they uh, they defer to fund managers and so on to, to do the real work, and they want to invest into something which is uh, low risk enough. They have a mandate uh, to, to 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 make the most of the resources in in a uh, in a secure manner for uh, let's say for uh, the investors. If we're talking a uh, mutual funds for pensioners, if we're talking a uh, pension funds and so on. Uh, so th th there are considerations that really uh, revolve around risk, which are essential for who puts the money into a project. And here, uh, I would remind you that in my view for what we have seen as EIB, there isn't, a, let's say, a one-size-fits-all approach for a circular economy project. We are really talking about projects that range from sort of startups that have brilliant projects, ideas, perhaps a pilot stage. And we're talking about very large established companies that, uh, that have really, um, you know, the need of having a lot of resources to change their supply chain, to change their production uh, facilities in a way which, which sometimes is, is having a huge impact. So all of this, <coughs> excuse me, all of this is, I would say, an ecosystem of, uh, uh, let's say, a range of companies uh, from from a small to large side business models uh, that uh, uh, rely on more established business models, and they will just change, uh, tweak some parts of the production process to entirely new ones, uh, which are perhaps not tested and therefore quite risky. Uh, for a bank to to support uh, new technologies that perhaps uh, need to have a, a lot of other considerations in terms of take up patenting uh, acceptance uh, by the wider markets uh, uh, and so on uh, as well as let's say more perhaps contractual um, issues that that often we see 
in uh, circular economy projects. By this, I mean the fact that also the, the, produ the production um, of specific feedstock, perhaps, due to a certain uh, quality uh, factor, be it uh, recycled materials that in the past especially uh, were marked by, by, by the problem of not being comparable, let's say, some metals or alloys and so on, could not be produced with the same quality standards that were required by industry uh, to use in their own production. Uh, I think more and more we are coming to, to technical solutions in more of those uh, in these in these sectors. But these are definitely some, some issues that uh, uh, investors and financiers are looking at. As well as on the output side, there is uh, very often, especially for new business models, uh, uh, a need to have very solid, uh, uh, so to think uh, properly, and then to put in place very solid systems where your output. Uh, um, is not depending on, let's say, uh, just a single client uh, that could go bust, that could have problems uh, um, also from a technical perspective. So it's important to, to optimize, diversify your sources and your output. So these are just, let's say, some of the considerations. Uh, again, today we're not going into depth in uh, uh, what are the, the, really the, the features in assessing circular economy projects. Um, but, you know, just to have everybody on, on the same page about what, uh, as investors and, and bankers, we are uh, considering here. Um, that said, today uh, I think I would like to focus a little more and then uh, open the conversation as well to, to questions or also uh, to, to a discussion with other panelists about what I thought uh, uh, would be in or could be, because we are talking hypothetics at the moment, I suppose, uh, the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on everything circular uh, economy. In that sense, in the slide number seven, I've put together a couple of, let's say, thoughts that, that I had uh, that relate uh, to what I've seen so far uh, as being the impact of the crisis on, um, on the world of circular economy. So, uh, here, uh, I, I would like, well, I just mentioned briefly what's on, on the page, but really I would uh, uh, encourage you to, to ask questions or really to start a conversation on this, because for sure uh, some of you have seen some of those issues uh, uh, from first hand or have other ideas about uh, what really could be a consequence of, of this crisis and really what are the opportunities in this for companies in particular, for investors as well. So here, one first consideration that I had uh, was really the amount uh, of single-use disposable, disposable healthcare equipment uh, that was used. I, I was reading that in uh, Alsace-Lorraine, a, a part of France that was uh, fairly affected by the crisis, one of the most badly hit uh, parts of uh, France for this. Uh, medic single use medical equipment use over two months went up over 40%. So, and this just in hospitals. So, without considering you know, the use, private use of gloves or masks and so on. Uh, this is it's a very big number, uh, of course, considering the hospitals very often for very uh, reasonable. Uh, background, of course, we, we don't want to risk infections and, and so on, but make a big use of this material. Uh, so really, one question is, how? what can be done? Uh, Technology-wise, I mean, there are other solutions. Yes, I've read about some of that from X-rays to other uh, techniques to reuse uh, some material, or maybe the material itself could be designed in a way that supports multiple uses or that can be then recycled and uh, reused elsewhere. So that's one consideration, food. Uh, the food production chain was, in a sense, surprisingly uh, resistant. Uh, I think in most of Europe, aside from the first couple of days where supermarket shelves were in some countries um, taken, uh, made empty, uh, but overall it was quite resistant. So this tells a lot about also the, the capacity of our uh, let's say societies and economic system to, to be very responsive 
Uh, and so having a lot of small actors uh, operating together is actually making a system quite resilient, uh, quite robust. Uh, on the other hand, in, in many cases, now the talk is about how to make systems more resilient in case of border closures or absence of seasonal workers. So these are really uh, considerations that all companies working in the sectors have faced. And the rethinking is is essential. So now is the right time. Uh, reshoring. I, I put this this point here because I believe, um, well, with me, uh, a number of uh, economists and uh, policymakers uh, uh, believe that uh, the value chains uh, that uh, very often stretch, uh, you know, over continents for producing, especially car manufacturing, is one, but electronics as well are too long, and not only too long from, from uh, let's say, an environmental perspective, of course, there are a number of costs, which we are very much aware, uh, being in this call about CO2 production uh, and so on, uh, and also the, the, the issue about uh, using too many resources that are uh, then not necessarily reused properly, uh, but also from very much from a business uh, security point of view, uh, just because without uh, having access to certain components, uh, the, the whole of your product cannot be assembled. So this is also a huge operational risk for, uh, for companies. So I believe we are going to see for sure uh, some rethinking of uh, industrial value chains uh, in some sector more, um, cars uh, come to mind, um, but also there is, I suppose, a political element. So in many countries, I think the discussion of the day is you have uh, an industrial policy, an active industrial policy, and again, I don't want to judge, there are pros and cons in uh, governments having hands on, um, I suppose, but here really the, 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 my point is about what's going to change? What are the opportunities here? Uh, so let's make things, uh, let's plan things and new supply chains in a way that uh, they are leaner uh, in terms of materials that is used, uh, in terms of waste that is produced. Um, another point which I think is very macro, very general about the acceleration of pre-existing trends, I think we are, going, we are seeing that already. So, for instance, the, the use of platforms such as Zoom or anything IT is really one of those things, but also the fact that uh, basically a deep economic crisis will kill zombie companies. Um, in a wider economy, unfortunately, also hitting uh, very good and efficient companies that just happen to operate in uh, in, uh, in the wrong sectors, uh, talking about pandemic business. Um, but here, definitely, there is a, an opportunity for innovative business models to come up and uh, uh, really take the center stage. Uh, then another more narrow consideration perhaps is home deliveries. I think all of us have probably used or certainly seen a lot more uh, material or even groceries delivered to uh, their home. And we did a huge amount of packaging being used. Now, there is ongoing uh, attention on this, I suppose, for already a couple of years. But from my personal observation, I see that quite a lot of material is just the, the, the polystyrene or styrofoam or just stuff that don't really look very much sustainable. Um, so definitely there's, uh, there is a challenge to this. I think the, the, the European Union, it's one of those elements that I found and you know, was, was quite positively impressed by, by that. There is quite a lot of policy action, which is expected to come and was already before. Uh, the COVID crisis from that front. Uh, uh, so this is really an area where both entrepreneurs and, uh, uh, and financiers should pay attention. You know, you want to be uh, ahead of the curve. You don't want to have then higher costs than necessary because regulation is putting more costs on you. You also want to have uh, a positive marketing vis-a-vis -vis your uh, your customers, your suppliers, you know, you are doing the right thing. So you are, you know, able to show that, uh, uh, you don't have a lot of things to be ashamed of also from, from these, let's say, very much PR point of view. Uh, so there's, uh, there's another area. And perhaps another one that came to my mind is public transport. So 
here, I mean, of course, um, Commissioner Bulls uh, uh, was very active on, on that front, and EIB, of course, uh, was also is one of the biggest financiers worldwide of public transport. Um, but unfortunately, we saw that during the crisis, public transport uh, really is a trade-off vis-a-vis the fact of needing to keep uh, distance uh, between people. So at least for, for a good couple of months, let's hope for a short, uh, periods, uh, I suppose the public transport will not be busy. Uh, that means more people will have to find other ways. Uh, so what does it mean? Probably a lot of opportunities also for using more sustainable, more sustainable models. So renting um, uh, equipment such as scooters, uh, uh, electric bicycles, and, and so on. I mean, this is, this is also a good example of an acceleration of pre-existing trends, but now really there is a huge market which is opening up, probably for a couple of months or, or years, I don't know, uh, but some of those habits that people will have taken will definitely stay with us. Uh, so this is a very good example for companies that, uh, that want, that maybe are already uh, had already pilot projects in that area to scale up and to, to really think this is our opportunity. So I would wrap up here uh, perhaps by um, coming back to uh, the activities of EIB, who we are and what we do. Uh, so as I mentioned, we are financing approximately 60 to 70 billion uh, euros of new lending per year. Um, in, uh, in particular, for the circular economy, our uh, activities will, we are aiming in the coming years uh, uh, to lend specifically for, uh, for strictly defined circular economy projects, something like between one and two billion uh, per year. Um, what we do, how we operate, is we finance directly fairly large projects. Um, also because we are a fairly uh, small institution, so we are not a huge bank. In that sense, even if the amount that we that we lend and mobilize indirectly are, are larger, um, but we also operate uh, quite extensively via intermediary banks. So we have a range of intermediary banks uh, in Slovenia, for instance, uh, Sidbanka is one. But we operate also providing resources to venture capital funds and uh, private funds that use our resources and our expertise uh, to, to support uh, a small-scale uh, project. Uh, so, really, my conclusion, and uh, perhaps you may want to take a look at the slides, uh, my last slide, number eight. Uh, take a look on our website. Uh, we have a circular economy guide, which gives a lot of examples about projects we have supported, really ranging from pilot schemes from startups to uh, large projects uh, um, which have uh, big costs but also very large impact um, in established sector, in really innovative sectors. Take a look there. We have uh, a new guide which was published uh, a couple of days ago. Um, so uh, I suppose uh, you you can really find a lot of interesting material there. Uh, that said, I would close here my direct intervention and I very much welcome um, ideas, thoughts, questions from anybody at home or in the panel. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Francesco. It was really very insightful and your slide number seven is uh, in many ways um, a great uh, a guide to many opportunities and challenges that we are facing um, in these days. So uh, from those who are, uh, from those ones that straightforwardly encourage uh, uh, more sustainable and particularly uh, even more, more uh, circular business models to those who impose um, unseen challenges like uh, uh, you demonstrated in the case of uh, the public transportation, where there's um, uh, a huge need for, let's call it the red redesign of uh, the current ways we uh, move around. Um, there are some questions coming up. Uh, and uh, I uh, would like to invite you all to, um, to uh, raise hand to, to ask questions directly. At this point, you may uh, wonder who is Massimos Barbaro, right? Because uh, a good part of the participants are registered under Massimos Barbaro. I sincerely apologize for uh, this uh, flaw. We will uh, correct this uh, by the second part of the uh, 
uh, seminar. Um, so you can simply uh, ask a, a questions by uh, demuting your mic and then uh, briefly pre presenting your, yourselves. Um, I will uh, take the, the, this few first uh, seconds to uh, get back to Francesco with, um, with, uh, with questions that he couldn't read because there were two uh, questions that, that came in during his uh, speech. Uh, the first one is, uh, could you please give us one or two relevant examples of projects where the bank helped with SDG uh, 13 climate action? And the second question, uh, what does it mean just business uh, from personal and, and business perspective? Uh, then uh, a, a, broader, a broader broader question, I think uh, I, I would first like uh, Violeta to, to address it later on. Uh, how do you think we can speed up the awareness of investors about circular businesses and also models and systems? How can mindsets uh, um, be changed and how to have more impact in investors? Uh, so, um, Francesco, back to you. Uh, maybe through the examples that the, uh, the, you can, uh, um, you can perhaps bring closer one, one, one topic that uh, I, I was thinking uh, through and could be very relevant also for the remaining part of the seminar. Uh, you are clearly prioritizing uh, uh, issues uh, in your financing um, uh, policy, You're clearly prioritizing uh, climate issues uh, and uh, issues related to, to sustainable development, both particularly those related to the environment. Uh, how does this match and at what stages uh, do you match this with your uh, uh, risk assessment, with your capital requirements? Uh, could you give us a little bit uh, further insight in, 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 into this and maybe just uh, demonstrate this on, on, on one or two, uh, two projects as one of our attendants uh, asked about, please? Uh, sure, you're, you, can you hear me? Yes, yes, please. Yep. Um, so perhaps we're going in order, well, t starting from your last point about risk management and risk assessment. Uh, so uh, as EAB, we have professionals which come from uh, the, the capital markets and banking world, so, so uh, applying the best practices and processes uh, of banking in our assessment of credit from, from a banking point of view. Uh, so in that sense, uh, we are operating, you know, assessing the financial strength uh, of, uh, uh, of a company, of an existing company perhaps, uh, um, or for um, kind of more uh, new innovative companies, uh, we take a slightly different approach. So we really uh, want to see how they are set up, organized, also, but of course also uh, what the capital resources um, they, they have at disposal. Um, so essentially, I won't go in details here, but something which is very much the traditional approach of banks. Interesting to say that for a number of years, uh, for a few years, let's say, and it's still a work in progress, we have started and we are actually at the forefront uh, of these to implement uh, uh, what we call climate risks in our credit assessment, which means assessing the the capacity of a certain business. To which That's very interesting. So yes, please, please. Yes, it is. It is, and I, I'm sure that uh, Zlaven will have much more on, on this. We had a com conversation last time we spoke on uh, specifically on uh, on these points uh, uh, again it would take quite a long it's a topic for perhaps conference in in itself but essentially we are uh, considering from both a, a, a business point of view and a financial uh, balance sheet and cash flow perspective what is the potential impact of let's say environmental and climate related risks be it the fact that a company has got physical facilities set close to, to the coast in a country which is prone to uh, maybe tsunamis and so on, and these are likely to increase over the years, or perhaps the risk of lawsuits, environmental uh, litigation, and, and so on. Uh, and all of these will essentially is already feeding into our uh, credit assessments, 
And perhaps the interesting thing is that this is already having, perhaps marginal, but increasingly having for us and for most other institutions, uh, also a pricing impact, which means that more sustainable companies, essentially, uh, will have advantages also in financial conditions. Let's say uh, loans that cost less or have better conditions. Uh, this is, let's say there are several working groups uh, put together by by the Basel, by the BIS, so the, the Basel system of uh, regulators, by national uh, central banks and so on, and individually by banks uh, to, to really start to more and more implement these considerations in uh, how they, they, they make credit decisions. Um, so I would stop here, but again, maybe this would be a topic for, for a separate and different uh, conversation. Yeah. I don't want you to lionize the, <laughs> the conversation. Topic, on the right, right. It is a topic for an, an entire conference. Uh, nevertheless, thank you for, for these clarifications. Yes. There's a, a follow-up question um, um, in, in this area. Um, uh, how uh, do you measure your impact for the projects in circular economy and sustainable ecosystems? Uh, what Good question. APIs uh, do you have in place? Do you think this is uh, an important part of the uh, shift? Uh, and um, uh, yeah, uh, please, uh, Francesco, back to you. Sure. It's an extremely important uh, topic. And uh, again, uh, we have made public, so it's on our website. Uh, there, is, uh, there is a number of documents. So I think one summarize that really goes quickly through the, the high level, through the KPIs we look at. Uh, and uh, we also make available publicly our methodology. It's a much more complex uh, um, paper, which really you know, sets out how to measure for certain specific activities uh, the amount of CO2, it, it's fairly technical, so, you know, also in this case I cannot go in, in depth into answering this, uh, uh, this question, but maybe two things uh, to, to, to answer this. First, we have a number of KPIs uh, which are open to public discussions, which we have discussed uh, not only with uh, uh, other multilateral institutions uh, and financial institutions, but also with uh, NGOs and, uh, let's say, the Commission also played a uh, big role in this. Uh, so really on how to be sure that impact is monitored. It's not just, let's say, an amount of 10 million or 100 million spent on these, let's say, renewables, but really to, to, uh, to be able in an objective and scientific way to prove these cause, uh, uh, let's say, X uh, tons of CO2 to be spared. These, uh, um, all the various implications. So uh, really for this question, the, the best uh, uh, thing to do is to check out on our websites, I believe, you know, just Googling EAB, um, climate KPI, climate methodology, will find plenty of material which goes quite in depth. So, um, perhaps also worth mentioning that as EAB, we are leading um, on, on two levels, um, both uh, worldwide with other, uh, with other multilateral financial institutions like the World Bank or Asian Development Bank and, and so on. Um, uh, projects on how to measure in an objective uh, manner so uh, the, the, the climate impact so that this can also be used by the private sector. Uh, we see our role also in making uh, easy, let's say easy to understand user-friendly uh, rules so that the, the private sector, let's say capital markets, uh, funds, investors uh, that want and are already actually uh, operating quite a lot in terms of green bonds and so on, use standardized uh, 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 understanding and disclosure of what they are doing uh, to avoid the, the so-called greenwashing. I think we were all uh, quite aware, especially in the past, and um, maybe I'm too optimistic, but I think it's something that more and more belongs to the past, uh, that uh, essentially everybody was calling green whatever they were doing. Uh, this is less and less uh, going to be the case, uh, also the, mm, on a European level, I was talking about the international level, but on a European level, together with uh, the Commission, uh, actually the Commission is leading this exercise, but the AB is one of the main uh, participants, uh, we have set out, we are setting out, the, the task is, let's say, almost completed, the so-called taxonomy of uh, environmental, uh, environmentally and sustainable 
uh, activities. Uh, so really to have a single language and to avoid that basically everybody is using different standards. So the standard setting element I think is hugely important here and as EAB we are really uh, you know, working in a, in a transparent manner to set these, this common language. A very, so very, I hope very important, uh, very, very good illustration. I think uh, just uh, to add on that, uh, you, you mentioned on your slides, but maybe it was not underlined uh, sufficiently enough that uh, one of your ways to exercise impact investing and, uh, uh, and uh, the, um, the imposition of, uh, of the rules and principles you've just um, uh, described is by crowding in, uh, in, in Slovenia, for example, with uh, Sid Banka, the, the Slovenian Development Bank, and, and uh, all over Europe or with many other institutions. And the size of investment just, I mean, I wouldn't like even to make a, a comparison with uh, uh, 60 to 70 billion euro of annual uh, financing you provide, uh, and uh, on, uh, and the Slovenian Investment Bank, uh, Slovenian uh, Development Bank, on the other hand. But I, to my knowledge, this is some four to five times more than the French Development Bank, which is a very successful institution. So, uh, just to, to to illustrate how important it is to be the market leader, uh, be the market maker for uh, uh, environment. Uh, uh, to, um, uh, uh, impact investing uh, uh, across uh, the European Union. Uh, Violeta would like to uh, raise hand, a hand and I, I'm giving uh, the word back to her. And there were other uh, hands that I, that I saw. So please, uh, Violeta first and then, then others. Uh, just uh, demute yourself uh, after Violeta and, uh, and speak up. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I was listening very carefully um, and uh, thank you for this uh, deep insight into the EIB, but uh, I'm a politician, so I'm going to be provocative because uh, I think that uh, the European Investment Bank has walked a long way, but it's still behaving too much as a classical bank and not enough as a development bank. And as a development bank, it should be more boldly and it should more, more boldly enter the new areas where, of course, um, the risks are higher, but that's why EU came up with the uh, Juncker's plan called FC, and the new so-called InvestEU uh, continues and it will offer even bigger opportunities to share the risks and go uh, into the areas that are not considered as uh, stable and reliable one yet. However, we need to trust ourselves and if our vision is to become uh, nat nature neutral by 2050, and if we already said in all our strategic papers that circular economy is the basic economy, economic model that we are planning to follow, then I would expect a bit more decisive actions and not just talking about new KPIs that are green, but actually having an open debate and really commit to the KPIs and the renewed process, uh, because everything needs to be reinvented in order to support this new concept. And if you want eco-civilizational concept, which is even larger than that and goes beyond 2050. So uh, here I would certainly invite EIB uh, to behave less as a classical bank and more as a development bank. Uh, and also uh, close, uh, work even closer with the EU We've done a long, uh, we came a long way, I have to admit. I remember the year 2014, and uh, now uh, it's a huge difference. Uh, but uh, we should continue to expand this cooperation and share the commitments, share the, uh, share the responsibility, but boldly go uh, into this uh, circular economy concepts and a green economy. It makes, perfect sense from a business point of view as well. EU is still owning more than 45% of all green global patents. So we need to do better in, uh, in, in the monet uh, monetization of them, in, in, uh, to bring them on the market. Uh, and this is where we're weak. So uh, I would certainly like to uh, invite that we strengthen the roadshows, that we strengthen the advisory board, which is part of the investment plan and really broader the capacities 
uh, the absorption capacities that people have. Project promoters are not educated well enough. And here, the advisory board and roadshows together with the members, uh, with the representations of EU in member states and with the commission portfolios, uh, we could really make a huge difference. I mean, I'm speaking from the experiences. Transport was never considered to be even uh, uh, interesting for, for the Juncker's plan. But in two years' time, we became one of the most stable portfolios that started to absorb an enormous amount of money. In which areas? In green transport and in digital transport. And these two are walking the path and new models are being built on a network axis, not on a chain anymore. Value chain is out, value networks are in, so we need to broaden the number of stakeholders that are part of this movement. So, um, as I said, it's a shift in our heads first, which means criteria, the processes, the models, and then the money follows. And I really count on EIB to, to continue to reinvent itself and to continue to be bold and push promotional banks on a national level, which are really, I mean, worse than the classical banks. They don't give a support to the local uh, project promoters to the point to, 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 to be really advanced. So here a lot can be done. And uh, just the fact that EIB has to establish offices in member states, you know, tells the story. These should be promotional banks. Uh, you should work with them. You should rely on them, but you don't because they don't do the job. Uh, uh, and uh, it's, it's a matter of knowledge. I'm not accusing anyone of uh, doing it deliberately. It's a matter of knowledge and awareness. And this is where we could play an important role together, even with webinars like this one, with uh, education that uh, like, um, uh, the CBA Academy is pursuing or the university uh, that Karen is representing and similar ones. So uh, it's, a, it's a movement. So, um, I, I mean, I really would like to put as much emotions out as possible. Uh, and uh, I know Slaven will talk to you later on and he can share uh, what's really the inner transformation that the banks are going through the class up with development banks as well uh, and uh, let's see if they can move faster maybe they can take some portfolio away from development banks and then the development banks will move faster as well so it's all about helping each other it, and, and sharing the risk and sharing the burden and and through the collaboration and, and discussions we can lower uh, the failure um, risk and it is important that uh, commission has on the table a report for transport only, but it will be expanded uh, to other areas as well, that shows that transport per year is causing 1 trillion euros of negative externalities. 1 trillion euros, 7% of European GDP goes to negative externalities. So if we only focus on that, and a huge part of that is of course pollution. And a because lot of that we are tragically seeing uh, right in these uh, weeks and months. Uh, exactly. And it, yes. many people are not starting to, 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 to argue that COVID and the spread of COVID is related to pollution because it's the biggest spread was really in the most polluted areas. So we need to start seeing our societies and our life and our economies from a fresh perspective. And yeah. I have a full confidence. That's why eco-civilization, good vision. Violeta, please prepare that slide, but I, I have to admit, it's, it, I'm, I'm having a hard time because we could go on just by interrogating uh, Francesco and yourself. So I now I, I am calling for the participant who, uh, who had a question uh, to speak up. So we have a, a, live, questions, uh, a live question for, from the audience. Yeah, do you hear me? Yes, please, please. Uh, could you please briefly present yourself? And, yeah, uh, I'm Manuel Vedra, um, calling hello. from Switzerland, um, working in an investment bank. Hello, man. And thanks again uh, for sharing your thoughts and facts. Um, really interesting until now. And uh, we were talking right now a lot on the EU level, and um, I was actually rising, uh, raising the question about the KPIs because I think it's a really, really important okay. fact um, to consider. But I think in the research and development of that KPIs, it's really important to work on a global level. 
and actually work with the global organization, not just on the EU level. Because if we just consider the EU level, we are not considering the emerging markets. And there, for especially if we develop uh, social KPIs, there are different methodologies have to use in European and development markets and the, um, the third party um, market. So I think there were a lot of talk uh, about European level, how it's collaboration with the global players, with Bloomberg, MSCI, with the World Bank. Mm -hmm. How is about that? Um, is there also a plan to have a standardized global KPIs to follow? Because I think then, the also the communication and the goals will be really easier to apply and go in one direction if we all follow the same KPIs. Thank you, Manuel. Uh, Violeta, would you like to take uh, this one? And then uh, Francesco and, and uh, Karin, would you like to? Did you raise a hand? Well, okay. Yes. First, I will be very short yep. because I've, I've talked enough uh, in this first part. Uh, all I wanted to say is that EU is one of the most important global players so if we stand up for something and if we really uh, start building the global multilateral agreements uh, we can help to change the world as well unfortunately we lost a big partner um, under most of my mandate i had a, uh, a very positive american administration who uh, we shoulder to shoulder were fighting in global institutions to bring the sustainable elements in decision making on a UN level in different agencies and so on. So we lost this partner at least temporarily. Um, but that doesn't mean we need to give up because China is interested in green because they have too many problems uh, with the pollution. India is interested in green. However, we need to understand that the message that they're sending to us, they said, you were polluting this world while we haven't even had the industry. Now you want us to take all the burden uh, for the pollution uh, uh, by ourselves. So we need to be very innovative in how we uh, manage these global multilateral agreements and uh, make sure that, of course, uh, we take part of the blame for the pollution that we cause globally. Uh, and uh, so it, it's it just to be honest and create multilateral, uh, multilateral partnership on a basis of honest engagement and shared responsibilities so um, but i've seen it i've done i mean many projects with chinese we uh, put together connectivity platform for new railway connectivity between europe and china and they were very much interested so there was not a problem if you pick up the right topic and you know that uh, 65 percent of all uh, traffic uh, transport pollution comes from uh, roads and almost 70 percent is from personal cars so um, it, you know, these are railway makes a difference. Uh, that's why EU is investing 70% uh, of all transport investments in railway capacities. And these are uh, India is very much pushing for that. Uh, and uh, there are huge investments going on in India in railway systems just to lower the pollution and to make sure that they still have a connectivity. So it's going on uh, on a global scale as well, but we need to be more sensitive and tune in. The, uh, if we want to lead the multilateral agreements. So Europe has okay. some weight, right? Yes. Yes. Francesco? Okay, perhaps I'll continue on this very, very interesting question. So I'll say for sure th there is a lot of work to be done and uh, things are moving perhaps less fast. Uh, the one would wish, uh, but trying to, to, to be quite pragmatic on KPIs and how to, to, to measure uh, the impacts uh, of financing, essentially. Um, yeah, I would say that in 2015 already there was an agreement, uh, and actually a document, I think it's also quite easy uh, to find online uh, by development banks internationally, so EIB was, of course, uh, part of the group, um, so the, with the aim of covering really the KPIs and the monitoring and the calculation of climate impacts uh, 
uh, of new projects of uh, activities financed. Uh, so this was fairly groundbreaking at the time. Um, the second thing also specifically about uh, common standard and KPIs, um, well, uh, again mentioned in EIB, um, we were the first institution uh, um, to, to issue so-called green bonds, which have now created a market which, which has boomed already and, and continues to to be booming, uh, where now the issuers are uh, national governments, private companies, uh, and so on. Uh, and they're also talking about the non-EU scale. Uh, so EAB, uh, most of them are, uh, most of the, the bonds issued on the capital markets uh, um, are actually bought by international investors, not necessarily EU investors. Um, I would also like to say that uh, uh, EAB uh, standards for green bond, the first one that we issued was in 2007, was subsequently uh, taken as a basis uh, uh, and then made the international standard by the ICMA, which is International Capital Market Association. Um, so essentially, the, the first, the skeleton uh, was created in Europe, but, but then actually went out uh, and now I would say that uh, the, 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 uh, the criteria um, that are also used by the private market for defining green bonds uh, are fairly solid. Uh, uh, I mean, of course, uh, we are still seen on the market and uh, the, 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 in the public media, uh, let's say a reflection of what's uh, less than perfect that maybe happened three, five, ten years ago. Uh, but more and more, I would say that also the capital market has got common standards and KPI and in a way of substantiates their claims, which is international and not just at EU level. Thank you. Um, Karin, uh, a remark from your side? Just, just very briefly from my side. Thank you for this very relevant question. Um, one of the problems we have in measuring impact is the, um, the paradigms under which we measure because um, we, we measure quantitative data, we measure how much, and we do not measure so far why and what. And this is something that, we'll, that we will have to take a look at and on how to measure this best um, and how to report on it and how to develop key performance indicators um, that are actually key impact indicators because it's not about how much we put into something um, and, and therefore we don't have the right measures uh, yet to, to really make this um, um, relevant and comparable. And this is, this is what we have to work on. Just Thank you. Very briefly. Thank you. Is there another qu uh, question from the audience? Uh, uh, if there is one, please uh, spare it for later. Uh, we will have some more uh, time for questions uh, later on. Uh, we will move to the next speaker right now. I really thank to Manuel for speaking up. I uh, thank uh, gratefully to Violeta and uh, Francesco for their excellent uh, contributions. Uh, and um, I am pleased to announce uh, the next uh, uh, speaker on the today's agenda, uh, who I think will also uh, deliver some more uh, insights on on the issue that uh, Carl in just just raised what we are actually measuring um, uh, uh, Slaven Michkovic uh, um, is uh, an experienced an experienced risk manager in in Abanka a researcher um, advisor to not only uh, in in the banking sector itself but also in the uh, public uh, finance sector um, and uh, he will uh, address the difficulties companies uh, meet when they approach banks with ambitious, sustainable or circular uh, business proposals. Uh, and he will also give you the whys and also some advice about how to go about it and uh, uh, get closer uh, to, to better understanding between uh, the two sides. Slaven, uh, please, the word is yours. Uh, many thanks, Yuri, and uh, also hello from my side to all the participants and, and the speakers. Uh, and please, all, pl please, uh, uh, please take over the screen as well. Uh, just you just press the the green button, share screen, and you're there. 
Do we have now my screen? Yes. Okay, I will increase it. Is it Great. okay now? Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So one, <laughs> I will repeat myself and say hello again to, to everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, I was very uh, pleased with uh, Violeta's introduction and definitely the part of her energy, energy touched me and I believe that I'm not the only one yet. Uh, uh, short introduction, yes indeed I work uh, for last uh, six years in Abanka, whole time in uh, risk department and currently I am responsible for stress testing, for macroeconomic scenarios and so on. Uh, as you mentioned before that, I work for uh, more than a decade in uh, Ministry of Finance and uh, very responsible for introduction of all these, uh, let's say, common EU methodologies in analysis of Slovenian budget. But let, let's jump to, to our topic. Uh, so how to communicate with the banks? My objective is uh, that in the next 10 minutes, uh, give you a few recommendations uh, in order to, to ease that communication. And yes, implicitly, I believe that all of us agree that uh, benefits of circular economy uh, are increasingly recognized. But then comes but yeah. But obviously, there are some uh, barriers uh, uh, in, in, in uh, that. Uh, many of them, we can, uh, we can classify that barriers in uh, cultural, technological, regulatory barriers. And indeed, there are also, let's say, if I may say so, financial barriers. Definitely, our rating uh, methodologies and models are not adequate. Uh, we also have uh, inadequate uh, financial schemes. So uh, uh, really we have uh, some problems and as uh, Violeta stressed several times, uh, although the, the path uh, we went uh, is uh, long, it seems that we are at the beginning uh, yet. Let me, uh, let me start with the imaginary example. Let's imagine that you have want to move that you want to move toward the circular model let's imagine that you have a product uh, with minimal harm to environment uh, and to society so you focus or the model uh, the product uh, is uh, built from fair materials if i may so uh, uh, the design of the product is long lasting uh, and of course, uh, uh, you assume uh, recycling a uh, huge percent of, of the product can be recycled. And on the top of everything, you have a good working conditions. So obviously you want to move uh, or the concept of value uh, from product to let's say service of the, uh, what product offers. Uh, if we uh, uh, quickly analyze uh, uh, that uh, uh, the bankability of uh, the project of introduction of that product uh, is based on new technology, uh, we have only statements. Oh, I, I, I forgot to say, let's imagine that you are a very young company, so let's say year or two. So we have only one year financial statements, profit and loss statement and uh, balance sheet. Uh, uh, the technology or the, let's say demand for this type of service is unknown to the bank. Uh, uh, we already stress that we have a minimal harm to society and environment. And uh, what is important for the bank is cash flow and uh, usually uh, the circular business project uh, have at least at the beginning uh, 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 negative cash flow and only after i don't know one year or two years we have a positive cash flow so uh, the question is uh, do we have advantage over a classical linear project am i sure that most of you believe or the know that answer unfortunately is no we do not have advantage. Why is that so? So if, if uh, 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 we want to ease our communication, we have to know what bank 
wants to know from us what bank is interesting about and uh, the first thing is we have to understand what are the existing practice uh, of the bank the, i think that that uh, the, the 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 key answer or, or the reason why our uh, let's say circular projects currently do not have advantage over the the the, the linear lies in, in 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 current practice of the banks so let's say that you are you are new client what are bank going to ask you about or, 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 or what are the major uh, factors banks take into account the first one is credit worthness of your credit worthness and secondly uh, uh, it is the value of collateral you are offer collateral you are offering to the bank so in order to uh, assess your credit worthness the bank uh, will analyze your balance sheet your profit and loss statement uh, so uh, all these aspects comes uh, to the let's say quantitative bracket many indicators uh, for liquidity profitability and so on bank will analyze and come to some conclusion the bank will usually put you in one of the five or ten brackets uh, you know they usually use letters a b c d uh, meaning uh, uh, the, the, with starting a highest uh, uh, quality and uh, the the letter d or e comes uh, for the lowest uh, uh, quality of course the bank uh, also have some uh, qualitative indicators unfortunately if you are a new company there are no too many these qualitative indicators like experience or, or the quality of the management board uh, uh, experience uh, with the client so uh, are you late in your uh, obligations uh, and so on so the next question is <laughs> what's wrong with that picture why why uh, all this is not enough that we have some advantage at, le at least that we are in the equal position with the usually uh, uh, linear projects uh, banks financing yeah uh, so we can jump uh, yeah uh, I will start with, with my presentation uh, the fact is that uh, uh, the bank currently cannot identify the risk which remains in uh, uh, linear projects yeah. uh, simply uh, uh, the 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 what the what this linear project do uh, do the, to environment or uh, 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 some uh, tax regulatory or climate uh, 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 things uh, uh, involved in linear projects cannot be measured simply looking at the balance sheet or, or profit and loss statement. There are nothing about uh, uh, circularity in, in these uh, financial statements. Uh, and not only that, yeah, uh, the existing rating models cannot capture uh, some uh, really specific uh, 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 profile of circular, uh, circular projects. So what is good, let's say, in circular projects is not measured, and what is bad in linear project is also not measured. Uh, so uh, I can jump to the next. Uh, um, also, uh, just looking at the financial statements there is nothing about externalities and all of us know that uh, uh, the linear model the, the linear economy uh, uh, produce uh, uh, a lot of externalities uh, uh, i think that uh, uh, violetta also mentioned uh, how many percentages from eu budget comes just uh, because uh, of uh, pollution of our environment yeah and uh, finally uh, uh, speaking about uh, regulatory things uh, the basel uh, agreement which is let's say or, or, or 
yeah, the top document uh, banks considering when analyzing uh, analyzing the risks uh, simply just uh, uh, marginally addressed uh, 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 this, uh, uh, let's say, shift towards circularity from existing linear models. Uh, I can go even uh, further on that uh, uh, I can say that Basel agreement uh, can be adverse to the uh, circle of financing. So what, can, what we can do about that uh, 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 in, in such environment when banks cannot measure our advantages and even regulatory documents uh, barely mention uh, 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 positive things about circularity, what we can do? Uh, <clears throat> Well, uh, uh, it's uh, definitely not of the game, and there are a lot of things uh, uh, we can do. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, I believe that uh, uh, if I return to the imaginary example, uh, uh, if bank is interesting in cash flow, then you have a really your first task is to produce. Uh, a reliable uh, 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 model of cash flow. So you will define realistic scenario uh, uh, about the use of uh, the service you are providing and uh, estimate uh, the, the, the uh, fee you can charge for your services and then uh, 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 produce a, a really uh, reliable cash flow. Uh, <clears throat> You can also, uh, how to say, think about what are the collateral, how you, you will intend to, to uh, how to say, uh, uh, give guarantees to the bank uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, possible financing. Yeah. So what you can emphasize, probably uh, uh, the quality of your clients, uh, in that terms, uh, the possible contract, uh, I think Francesco mentioned that in, in listing the risks, the contract you may offer to your clients could be very, very important uh, for the bank to understand. Uh, 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 you can also uh, 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 address the, the asset quality you are offering uh, to the bank. So uh, really, uh, the bank have some... some uh, something in, in the hand uh, as a collateral. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, overall, uh, uh, you can, uh, let's say, emphasize all the things uh, coming uh, from, from uh, your shift uh, from linear to risk uh, uh, model. Uh, and uh, I think that at this stage, uh, it's not only uh, on you, and I believe that uh, uh, it's not only you who, who uh, have to adapt to a new environment. I strongly believe that uh, uh, also the banks have uh, uh, the task uh, in, in uh, uh, this, let's say, movement from linear to risk. Uh, 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 somebody before me said that uh, we have to share the things and all of us are in this uh, game. So uh, uh, there are very important part on the bank side. So my recommendation, what I want to say, my rec recommendation uh, uh, also uh, comes uh, to the uh, bank side. Um, <clears throat> so every time, every time uh, the bank uh, uh, gives uh, uh, the, the loan or uh, uh, yeah, provide a loan to somebody also reserves the part of uh, the capital for that loan. Uh, meaning uh, the capital adequacy currently is uh, the top priority for all the banks. So uh, what I want to say, uh, in other words, is uh, we have to integrate the, the capital requirements in uh, circular uh, related risk. Yeah. Currently, uh, we are not doing that. And uh, uh, the way how we can do that, now I'm referring to the green documents of the, the previous EU uh, Commission. 
uh, uh, they proposed uh, uh, two things, uh, two indicators how to uh, uh, integrate uh, uh, these risks into the capital uh, adequacy. There are two possible uh, uh, indicators or factors we can introduce. The first one is uh, circular supporting factors. And the second one is the linear penalizing factor. In practice, it means that every bank has to split the portfolio in two parts. One is, uh, uh, one part is uh, uh, connected with the so-called linear projects, and another one uh, is connected with the uh, new, new uh, um, circular projects. So uh, uh, the capital, uh, the, the uh, circular supporting factor will reduce required capital for uh, uh, these projects, for the circular projects, and oppositely, the linear penalizing factor will uh, increase the required capital for the linear projects. In such a way, uh, 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 let's say, the bank can uh, give some advantage to, to the circular projects. And as far as I know, I believe that uh, 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 this project is uh, highly ranked uh, on the priorities of the current EU Commission. And I believe in the, the next 12 months, uh, uh, we will see uh, the new regulation which will uh, uh, favorize uh, uh, or give some advantage to, to, to uh, movement to the, let's say, sustainable financing and in line with that to the circular uh, uh, projects. Yeah. Of course, this is not the only one recommendation I can list. Uh, come, uh, some of them are listed in, in the uh, last uh, slide. Uh, uh, I believe that uh, uh, Sorry, my battery is out. Okay. Uh, first of all, I believe that uh, uh, circularity or uh, 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 sustainable financing has to be part of uh, uh, bank strategy. Uh, uh, at the beginning, I mentioned that uh, current rating methodology uh, is uh, uh, not enough uh, good or uh, I may say not penalizing uh, or not give advantage to the uh, companies which wants to move to the circular model. So yes, we have to, to upgrade our current risk methodology, our current uh, uh, rating methodologies. There are probably a number of, of, of them, but uh, I believe uh, uh, for the beginning uh, uh, that is enough from my side. Uh, uh, I'm open to your possible questions and uh, Yuri, that's for now uh, uh, all from my side. Thank very well, you. thank you very much, uh, Slaven. Could you please share with us uh, the slide that was there for a very, very short time, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, circular and, and linear risks, because I think we'll need this, uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, 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 Yuri, I deliberately, I deliberately didn't uh, go into details with this. I believe that uh, most of our participants already know or see that table. Uh, but of course, uh, there is a need. Uh, I, I would just, I would just like to make a short comment here. Uh, you basically, you are saying uh, uh, that uh, on one side, um, circular risks are. Uh, overly uh, e exposed in the uh, in, in current uh, um, risk assessment and linear risks are largely omitted and this is the Basel constitution for banks that uh, actually is the starting point and even though Francesco gave us a, a, I think a very good in insight into how things are changing this this is the gap that is being uh, created and uh, if we want, I think there's one thing more to, to take over into the, uh, the next stage uh, of this seminar. Uh, Violeta said uh, value chains are out, value networks are in. Uh, I mean, uh, when we look at both linear and circular risks, uh, we, our understanding in terms of circularity increases if we uh, analyze them along value chains but when these value chains became become value networks of course we have to take a broader stakeholder view 
So with these thoughts, I would like to, uh, to um, ask the participants to, to carry this over to the, to, to the part one and uh, also uh, when they were uh, also to the lunch break when um, uh, they will be invited to fill in uh, the, circul uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the circularity assessment uh, score, apologies. Uh, so um, there is a, a comment uh, for you, uh, uh, Slaven, uh, 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 saying that uh, for the situation uh, like that is not uh, limited only uh, to, to Slovenia or, or, or Europe, uh, in the opinion of uh, our participants, uh, uh, well, what is your opinion? When uh, are the banks going to be more uh, to be more open to support smaller entrepreneurs to develop, uh, for example, off-grid energy uh, so solutions? Is there a clue about that that you would like to briefly uh, reply uh, right now? Uh, sorry, you you ask me. I I, I yeah. don't I, I don't see the question. Here. Uh -huh. Uh, under, uh, I'm going to read it uh, once more. In yes, your sir. opinion, uh, when will uh, the, uh, the banks going to be more open to support smaller entrepreneurs to develop, for example, off-grid energy solutions? Can we expect uh, banks to sy systemically uh, change? I mean, uh, uh, EIB is uh, working a great deal towards that, uh, but do you do you expect a very different uh, typology of, of commercial banks uh, down the road uh, are you are you an optimist let's let's put it like that definitely definitely i think that uh, as speakers uh, before me said that the eu is leading in that area and uh, this comes also to the banks so so the the banking regulation regulation will be definitely changed as all other things, I believe that uh, this current situation a little bit, uh, 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 how to say, uh, stopped. Uh, 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 well, stop is not the right word. Yeah, uh, just prolong uh, 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 the process. Yes. Yeah. yeah uh, this process, uh, 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 but from the information coming from uh, Association of Slovenian Banks, uh, I believe that it may happen uh, in the autumn time. Okay. Uh, so, very well. Probably next year, uh, banks will have to, to change their rating uh, systems, uh, their rating methodologies, and then uh, uh, you know the, the assessment of uh, uh, circular projects uh, projects can be really the real one, and all the advantages coming from uh, that projects will be adequately measured. So we need to understand the starting point also because things are going to things are changing and are going to change relatively fast um, in in the near future. Uh, I'm speaking uh, in yeah. uh, Yuri. I'm just uh, 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 I'm just speaking for EU banking system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah of course. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am a little bit worried about time uh, i think i hope you are still doing okay uh, and you have um, sufficient energy left uh, there is a, our next speaker that i would like to um, briefly introduce um, uh, karin kuber uh, heim is um, one of the leading austrian and not only austrian um, experts on uh, sustainability um, as the program director or at uh, uh, the university of applied sciences in Vienna, uh, focusing on uh, sustainability and uh, responsible management. Uh, she has uh, a, a significant insight into the practices of uh, the banking sector and not only. Uh, and um, uh, when we were preparing this seminar, I asked uh, her to, uh, to go a little bit deeper into uh, the decision-making uh, at different levels, and what are uh, the, what are the different roles that um, is, uh, stretch from uh, the uh, supervisory boards uh, or executive boards to middle management to experts and other uh, participants uh, in this um, circular transformation? Uh, so, uh, Karin, could you please uh, take the word uh, and uh, take over the screen as well? Thank you. Thank you. I will take over now and share.
Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Uh, Great. Um, yes, so a warm welcome to all the participants also from, from my side here in Vienna. Um, thank you, Yuri, for making me part of this excellent um, panel and this uh, wonderful discussion that we've been having so far. Um, let me contribute now with um, the perspective of the corporates. And when I talk about corporates, I also include banks actually here. Um, because what I also do next to my um, academic, um, academic activities, um, I, I support and advise organizations on how to implement um, uh, sustainability at the core of their business strategically and how to align their um, business strategies with the sustainable development goals, the, the global goals of the United Nations. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, this is why um, post-COVID, um, and, and we've had, a, we've had a, an ongoing discussion in, in the chat already, um, which I very much favored. Um, um, post-COVID, the future um, is, is already there. So um, we have been taking care, and, 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 and many of us are still taking care, and the crisis is not over, of the immediate response um, issues that we have to take care of. But still, there are many other um, um, issues um, due to um, our unsustainable behavior on this planet in the past um, some 40, 50 years um, that will not go away by us just sitting at home um, or going um, or taking our bicycles uh, rather than taking our cars. So this is, this is a long-term um, systemic perspective that we need to have here and that we need to apply. And this, this refers um, to each of us from from politics, authorities, um, municipalities to down to citizens, consumers, but of course it refers also to research um, or, or, or academics um, and also to businesses because business actually is at the core of, um, of society and business has always been and will always be the driver for innovation, for, for innovation that, that serves society. Um, this has been gone lost actually um, in the past um, decades of globalization and of um, neoliberalism uh, in, in, in our um, economic system, which, which is a shame because this is what actually entrepreneurship um, is meant to be and that this is what markets um, have been made for to serve the people um, and when we now talk about post-covid activities um, i really um, want to put your attention now to um, how can we how, how can business be a part or take um, their their very important role um, to provide growth that gives back more than it takes um, there are the already mentioned UN Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs or Global Goals, um, that, um, that provide uh, tremendous business opportunities um, to 20, um, up to 2030 and of course beyond. It's only 10 more years to go, so this is really, um, this is really a challenge and we do not have all the solutions yet. And when um, several um, players or decision makers um, from business to society to politics um, scream for uh, where are the solutions, well, we have to collectively develop them. We have to, to join up, um, form interdisciplinary, cross-sectoral collaboration and cooperation to find those solutions. But we can, because right now, globally, even though this may not refer to each and everyone, but globally, we are the richest, the most healthiest, um, the best technically equipped um, society that this planet has ever hosted. So this, this bearing this in mind, we should really um, not fall back onto old um, habits um, or behavior that brought us into this crisis that we are trying to deal with now. Um, which costs us an enormous amount of money, um, as does the, the climate crisis um, that we have been causing. So 
really um, instead of looking backwards and, um, and, and, and trying to, to bring historic things that do not work into a future where they do not apply anymore, we should really look into the future and see this future as, as, the, as a um, collectively agreed upon one that is good for, for people, for the planet and for business. Um, the European Green Deal um, um, is um, um, the operationalization, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm not getting out this word. It operationalizes um, what, um, the, what the vision of the goals is and, and brings it down to, um, European, to, a Europe, to the European market and the European citizens. Um, and it also um, bears um, sustainable investments in, in an enormous um, uh, amount. Um, but yet, many companies are still stuck in the past. Um, they, in the next decade, they can either adapt and thrive, or like the dinosaurs um, that have been very, very big creatures on this planet, and still they died. So no one is too big to fail um, for the future. And this change that we're looking for and that we need must come from the top. Uh, and this is, um, this is something that is very um, worth looking into for business. Um, and businesses already do around the globe um, because they see the opportunities in several systems um, where they can provide solutions. Um, um, develop technology that is applicable um, or innovative um, to, to provide humanity and to provide people um, with what they need uh, rather than what they may not need and what would, will cause just uh, more trouble. So to align with this um, vision of a world that is more sustainable, more just, um, more healthy, greener than the one that we have been creating in over the past 50 years, um, bears um, numerous um, opportunities for businesses that are very, very um, worth looking into. Um, to future-proof a business um, these days means to put sustainability and technology at the core of the business um, because only this way we can drive sustainable change. Um, so businesses, corporations, whether it's banks or, financial or other financial institutions to um, private, privately owned businesses or capital market oriented businesses, SMEs, um, startups, have to reconsider um, what they ask themselves when they enter a market. It's no longer are our products and business models profitable. The profitability is the core, otherwise you wouldn't be a business or you would not be, um, you would not, you should not call yourself a business. So yes, profitability is key, but it should not be the very, very first and single bottom line that you ask yourself. You should rather ask yourself, are our products and business models future proof? And this is a much harder, um, much harder, um, um, much harder scrutinizing your um, business model and the products and the services you currently sell because not many of them qualify for the world that we want to live in. Um, of course, this um, when I talk about sustainability. I always bear circularity in mind because circularity, a circular business model, a circular economy is the only plan that we have currently to, to, um, to be able to deliver growth or to reach growth within our planetary boundaries. Um, and, and therefore, um, circular economy is at the heart of sustainability and it needs to be at the heart and minds um, and the awareness of businesses as well. So when we talk about um, a new business excellence that is needed for the future, um, I, I, I put together a couple of elements that are extremely important and that each um, business, um, no matter in what sector or how big it is, should really um, um, put at the, at the very top of the agenda. 
Um, first of all, it's the knowledge and the analysis of social and environmental impacts, positively and negatively, along the entire value chain. Um, we need to know the full life cycle of products, including the material sourcing, the production, the consumption, the disposal and recycling processes. And we need to be completely aware of stakeholders' expectations and concerns in all those stages. What we currently do not have is um, in, 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 in applied business, but I can also say this from, um, from, my, from, my, from the point of view of teaching in business schools. I teach a lot in business schools. And um, students to this day do not get taught instruments that apply to this kind of, um, of, of, of business perspective. They still get taught the Porter value chain, which you all who are in business will be very much aware of. The Porter value chain um, was efficient um, and, 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 and did apply in the 80s, 90s, maybe even the millennium but it does not apply any longer. And it's really um, disturbing to see the Porter value chain still being so highly in use and being even taught um, to students who will be the future decision makers and the leaders um, who have to take care of those challenges and issues that we're facing. Because th this, this is almost like you want to repair a computer with a hammer. Um, it, they do, it, this is a, a tool that does not apply for the future. So this is really, these, these are really things that need to be integrated deeply already in um, when, when we educate um, business um, leaders. Um, so this is one of the, one of the most um, important elements. Um, of course, we need this vision, we need to be aligned, we need to all go into the same direction. Um, we have those um, one, um, 169 targets below the 17 goals. We have 233 indicators on how states can measure progress. Um, if, um, if companies, corporations, um, uh, businesses um, look into them, they will see what is needed um, from, from them and for them to contribute to this kind of a future. Um, uh, so a very important element for, for, for business is to understand the systemic and transformational nature of the SDGs. Systemic means that I cannot pick and choose, first of all, and secondly, um, if I, if I um, target one goal or if I choose targets from below the goals where I can contribute, um, this means my contribution um, on, a, on, a, on a corporate level, but also on a state level, may cause a spillover positively, but also negatively on other um, sectors um, in my industry, on other industry, on people, or even on other states, if this is on a state level. Um, so therefore, it is very important to know uh, the interdependencies and the, 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 the the systemic character um, of um, contributions to the to to the goals and contributions to a better future, um, and the second part is this is a paradigm shift in the mindset of um, of economic players who so far always um, have been taught and have applied um, the what's in for me thinking. Um, this has even stretched to society and to, um, to consumers and, and, and who have been brainwashed by marketing in the past um, 50 years um, to only think what's in for me when they think about something. Uh, this is a, actually not a deeply human um, thought because humans are social animals and this is how we thrived from being um, uh, from the stone age to now we collectively we joined up and we, we 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 came together in groups and we hunted together so this is really something that we that we need to bear in mind this is this has been this has this mindset of what's in for me and where is my personal gain my personal um, profit my corporate profit my um, where where am i in this is relevant 
but it should not be the very first um, question to ask and it should not be the very first answer to be given. Um, and the paradigm shift in the sustainable development goals is that we have to come to a different mindset that is asking, how can I contribute? So if, um, if, if, if corporations look into the goals um, and into the targets, then this is not a checkbox um, exercise where they can say, oh, I, I'm doing this and this and this, so I'm, 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 I'm taking care of good health for my employees. Um, I foster quality education and gender equality and, um, um, whatever, I do some energy efficiency measurements, um, check, 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 I'm, I'm contributing to the goals. This is not enough um, because where we are currently is not enough. This is why we have the goals and this is why we need to move. Um, so they should rather look into where do I need to contribute? Where can I as a corporation with my knowledge, my technology, um, as, a, as an investor with my money, um, as a community with our um, shared goals and visions, how can we contribute um, and where do we need to contribute to make this happen and to make the world this kind of a place by 2030 and beyond? So this is really this 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 really needs a different mindset that is by far not common in in business um, and unfortunately not with many people. Um, uh, number three, a very um, very 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 um, important element for business excellence is the setting of measurable targets, and we have already had this discussion. Um, of the KPIs and the key um, impact indicators um, that that need to be redesigned. Um, there, there, there will be. There are several approaches, um, uh, and I'm sure we can make this. We we are able. We we are intelligent. We we are the most intelligent race on this planet. It should be it should be easy to come up with relevant indicators. I mean, this this really should be an easy task. We just need to get up and go and really make this happen. Um, uh, I know we don't have them yet, um, but, but we will have them, I'm sure. I'm very positive. Um, number four, I would definitely say that um, corporate reporting for um, corporations is a very, um, a very um, important element because it is a strategic management tool. It gives um, corporations' insights into their um, entire value chain, risk insights on how to manage those risks, how to how to mitigate them, how to how to proactively um, um, tackle them, and how to turn them into an opportunity rather than have them on on, on the risk side. Um, um, which is which brings enormous um, achievements in how you can develop or develop as a corporation, how you can develop innovative um, new um, products or solutions, how you can move forward um, um, uh, towards um, a better future for your business and create a value for everyone who's involved. Um, so delivering information on how sustainability targets and goals are achieved is key. Um, you need to be clear of what they are um, and what kind of a value um, you create by reaching them or achieving them, not only for your business, but also for society and planet. Um, mm, this is one of the hardest parts or has or is, is proving to be one of the hardest parts so far those so-called esg criteria the economic environmental and social um issues that um, um that, that that corporations activities and decisions are causing or or that they are part of um, um this is very this this is for the for the most of them and, and actually there is a new um, study out it's um, 78 of Europe's largest companies fail in adequately reporting um, on environmental and climate related risks despite the EU guidelines that are given so this the so-called materiality the most relevant for stakeholders to report um, is 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 not um, not um, well covered. The question is um, to me, 
I can see, of course, the companies that I work with um, are rather are looking for support in doing this because this is what I support them with and what many of my colleagues and my teams are supporting people with, um, um, corporates with, um, because they do not know better. Because, I mean, as I mentioned before, they work with um, insufficient tools. Um, that do not give them those, provide them this full perspective, and therefore it will never become really material. And, um, and others, of course, um, are misusing um, reporting um, for marketing reasons or attracting investors or um, um, putting a, a veil on their not so green activities. Um, so there is definitely room to improve. Um, one room, one one element to really improve this and to show that you are serious um, as a corporation um, or a financial institution is um, to formalize sustainability in board charters and governance as well as in policies for operations. This is this is a key tool um, to really achieve um, true corporate sustainability and to really achieve true um, contributions um, um, to a, a different economy. Um, there needs to be guidance um, on how uh, or, 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 or what sustainable innovation is and, and, and there need to be um, um, clarity on circular business models and their, their opportunities and chances. So a well-structured sustainability committee serves um, 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 this with um, with steering sustainability right to the heart of the company, bringing in um, circular um, business model innovation into the company's strategy, um, and really um, provide um, a good start into a sustainability journey for a company. Um, um, the, the sustainability committee um, or the board could be um, um, wherever, whatever applies to a company, um, could really be the driving or can really be the driving force um, um, of, um, of innovative um, sustainability um, in a company, whether it's a non-executive board or an advisory council with external experts or an internal board at executive level. Just make sure that you have the right people in there who really are experts and not just have friends sitting in there because this is something that I can tell you happens in Austria very often. Um, so the result um, needs to be a total integration of sustainable business practices into the company. So this should not be a separate committee um, that, that just um, uh, pops up here and there. It should be integrated um, and, and really be part of the game. Um, um, very large um, corporations around the globe are already um, um, using the board um, steering sustainability boards, sustainability experts in boards um, um, uh, um, to, to ensure um, um, a robust overview and long-term value creation. Um, here are um, 10 tips um, for, that I put together for boards. Um, from defining long-term value as a priority to board charters, boards, integrate board agendas, um, have a senior member of the organization chair the board, um, both in terms of the business experience and the sustainability experience, because remember, it's, it's about the sustainability of business. It's not about sustainability here and business on the other side. This needs to be thought together, brought together, and acted upon together. Um, and if you, if you see this not as a separate or st standalone agenda point, this will immediately go into, um, uh, uh, be, be presented in the reporting as well, because a sustainability report is a nice thing, but if it is not um, matched and, 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 and integrated with the business data and with the business performance, um, and the business strategy, it does not make any sense um, because it will never do what it could do. Um, so the incorporation into the strategy and the annual targets, not so much the quarterly ones, um, but the annual ones um, in the reporting is very, is very um, um, 
relevant and to materialize, meaning um, really pick the most important ones um, uh, and, make, and, 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 and make objectives and targets so that the board is able to oversee the progress as well, not just the external, but, but of course also ultimately the um, external stakeholders that you want to inform include the good and the bad because not everything is good. Um, this, is, this is a fact. Um, we are not where we would like to be and, 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 and just putting out the, the good stuff. Um, you have a marketing department for this. Um, corporates have PR departments. Um, you can make a great um, image campaign, but this has nothing to do with corporate reporting um, on, 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 your, on, on creating value. Um, for society um, and definitely um, when something has worked it's important to analyze why it has worked um, and the same of course refers to if it has not worked so again here we are um, we're looking we need to look into the KPIs or the measurements that we put on it because um, just by measuring quantities um, or financial outcomes, we will not see the full picture. Um, and there is nothing wrong with measuring this and providing information on it, but the perspective needs to be widened. Um, and this refers also to the risk angle and the opportunity angle. So this really needs to be widened. Um, and last but not least, um, I think Violetta has mentioned it, education is key. It's not only key for students um, who will be the leaders of tomorrow. It also refers to the ones that we already have in corporations and companies, to all the decision makers. And it also, of course, refers to board members. Um, um, they need education and there is nothing wrong with it because education is something that will accompany us for the rest of our lives. And it makes our lives um, more colorful and more interesting than sticking with the same old stuff that we've always done, always applied and always known. So. I am a strong advocate for, for constant education um, and, 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 and knowledge creation. So thank you. This was it from my side. I have kept you from lunch for quite some time now. And um, please um, take this um, with you uh, into the lunch break. This is Franz Timmermans who has said that um, in regard to the, the, the COVID crisis, uh, and, and all the voices that have been coming up um, on taking the Green Deal down because there is no time to, to, to take care of this now. The, the Green Deal actually, actually is not a luxury. We really need this um, to, to come out um, better from this crisis than uh, the way we went into it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Karin. Uh, indeed, uh, very insightful. Uh, I, I, I regret that we cannot uh, take uh, more minutes for a debate because you raised so many good questions. And it's really like a manual for, for corporates. Um, really an important contribution. I think also that, uh, there was a question that uh, raised uh, the half time of your speech uh, uh, in brief. Uh, how do you convince a CEO who sees sustainable development as a buzzword uh, to get closer and start considering uh, SDGs uh, to its uh, business? So uh, I think in the last uh, slide, you gave hands-on uh, um, replies to that. Uh, and uh, I, I would say start from the board, that would help already and then education 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 because all this is not just about uh, 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 changing some tactics it's really about getting um, uh, the understanding uh, in in the inside of, of us just as Violeta started this uh, this day <laughs> uh, so um, uh, in the, I think we we uh, we have had a very intensive morning and it's uh, one o'clock and I think everybody deserves uh, lunch right now. So I will uh, allow myself uh, uh, to take only 60 more seconds to, uh, to you uh, to, um, to uh, 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 prepare you for uh, the rest of the day. Uh, and that will be here. Uh, 
very simple. Please uh, fill in uh, your circularity assessment score. Uh, it is a very practical tool that can help you uh, communicate with investors, communicate with banks, communicate with boards, uh, and above all, uh, understand yourselves and your business model. Uh, and uh, how do you do that? You go to this um, uh, website, uh, www.circularbusiness.academy, you find uh, the window uh, uh, titled Circularity uh, Assessment Score, everybody can do it, and then uh, read the instructions and uh, click here on the green button to start uh, uh, compiling the questionnaire. It will not take a long time. This is the, the, the quick version of the circularity assessment score. Uh, if, when you will have submitted it, uh, our team will, um, will, will work it out and will send you back the report. So with this report, you will be able to um, attend the second half uh, by, uh, and receive some feedback to it. Um, uh, oh, uh, and uh, the last thing uh, to say is apologies again for not uh, being able to expose your names. If you are okay uh, with uh, Massimos Barbaro, who is our dear uh, team member uh, and our IT um, uh, manager and partner, uh, if you're okay with that, you can stay tuned in. Uh, the, this room will, will stay open uh, through lunch. If you would like to um, uh, reapply at uh, 15.30, then uh, please uh, uh, follow the link that we will uh, send you once more during the uh, lunch break. And, and yeah, you will then attend uh, the second part of the seminar with your name tag. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, this was um, a, very, um, uh, a very good meeting indeed. I thank to Violeta, to Karin, to Slaven, and of course to uh, Francesco Ferrero, uh, who, who we cannot uh, see, but uh, who, who's been uh, as well extremely um, uh, helpful uh, during this day. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in uh, shortly after, after the lunch break. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.